A new ruling means it should be a lot quieter today outside of defendant Karen Reed's hearing, but the drama will be high as ever as this case prepares to go to trial. And shocking physical abuse from a bus age directed at a boy with autism. And the child's parents say it's important that you see this video. And as the world's reacting to the news of O.J. Simpson's passing, I'm bringing back a revealing one-on-one -on -one conversation with one of the legendary attorneys on his dream team. It's all coming up next for you, plus much more right here on Opening Statements. TGIF. Good Friday morning to you, my friends. Welcome to Opening Statements. I'm your host, Julie Grant. This show, I say, is kind of like coffee and court. It's morning time. We get you all warmed up and primed to hear the case evidence coming up on Court TV Live. We cover the major cases we're broadcasting that are at trial and then the other ones not yet at trial that are just making us talk in the world of true crime. So right now, why don't you go ahead and grab that cup of coffee because it's time for my opening statement. Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman. My opening statement this morning is dedicated to them. She was 35, he was 25. They were friends. Together their lives were cut tragically short. They were innocent, they were attacked, and they never really got justice. And despite that very sad reality of nobody ever being held criminally responsible for their murders. They both managed to leave behind positive and powerful legacies. Nicole was a loving mother, daughter, and friend. Ron was a loving son, friend, and brother. His family turned the tragedy of his death into a legacy of helping crime victims through the Ron Goldman Foundation for Justice. Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown Simpson were truly loved and are deeply missed. Their memories will continue living on with love and with light. This June will mark 30 years since their untimely deaths. And when a loved one is lost in such a brutal way, the trauma reaches far beyond just the scene of the crime. It forever changes the lives of everyone who adored them. So may their families and their dear friends continue on their healing journey. May they find comfort in knowing that the beautiful memories of the lives of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman will never be forgotten. That's my opening statement on this Friday morning. Let me know if you like it. Right now, it's time for your daily docket. They're going to know what we're here, what, you know, what we're investigating and that we're still, we they're going to think I killed him. Why would they think that? They always have said that. They've always, always, always have said that. Well, have I told you it's because I'm the blue-eyed white dragon. That's what they call me. Because they don't want him with me. So he's basically just not really been around his family because he chooses me over them. Here's a look at some of the cases we're following for you today on Court TV in Florida. You just saw her there. Defendant Sarah Boone is set to appear in court at 9 a.m. Eastern Time. She's got a status hearing on her case. In Massachusetts, we're going to see the final pretrial conference for defendant Karen Reed. This is going to be the last time that motions are argued ahead of her upcoming murder trial set to start next week. We're going to go there live together in our next hour when Court TV Live begins. And in Colorado, we've got Nicholas Jordan. He'll be in court at 1 p.m. Eastern today for a preliminary hearing. He's accused of killing two people, including his roommate, on a Colorado Springs college campus. We begin this morning by getting all ready for this morning's final hearing before Karen Reed's murder trial, as the judge is expected to rule on dozens of motions to either allow in or to exclude case evidence. This week, the judge also agreed to the Boston Globe's request to unseal some of the documents relating to the defense's failed motion to dismiss. Investigators say Reed hit and killed her boyfriend, police officer John O'Keefe, with her SUV. Her lawyers are claiming that there's a cover-up with the investigation. 
U.S. attorney confirmed during that conference call, confirmed for both parties, that not only has there been a federal investigation of this case, but it is ongoing. It's not over. It continues. The DA had this confirmed for them just yesterday, right from the horse's mouth. That means, Your Honor, that District Attorney Morrissey and his office are targets of a federal investigation. And please consider what that means. Now, as her case heads to trial, the most important question is, will there be justice for the victim, John O'Keefe? That's what I want to know. I have two outstanding guests on the program this morning. Let's bring them in now. One of them is an attorney in Boston. That's our friend Wendy Murphy. She's also a law professor. She's been a prosecutor. She does a lot of civil rights work now. She's also an author of the book, Oh No, He Did It. And we have with us law professor and trial attorney Dante Mills. And Dante, I've got to congratulate you. You teach at Temple University School of Law that was just ranked number one in the nation by US News and World Report for trial advocacy. So I know you're really proud of that. Uh, let's really tap into your legal experience, both of you, please, as law professors. The first thing I wanna ask you about is this motion from prosecutors to preclude Karen Reed from raising a third party defense. Ladies first, please. Wendy Murphy, would you start us off? What do you think about this? Well, it's not, um unanticipated that they would <clears throat> um, seek to do this, but I'm not, I'm just not sure it matters very much because even if all the evidence comes in and, and we've heard it over and over again, that Karen believes some of the person did it and there's a conspiracy to cover up the true culprit. Um, there's really no there there. So I'm, I'm inclined to say, just let it in so that the jury can think to itself, what a bunch of bozos this defense team is trying to suggest that anyone else but Karen Reed did this because the evidence against Karen Reed is so overwhelming. Now, having said that, there is a body of law in Massachusetts, and I'm sure it's similar in other states, that uh, forbids the defense to falsely accuse a third party of committing a crime where there is no evidence. And so I think there's actually a really good chance the judge is going to forbid them from raising this defense in general. And now remember, the defense hasn't said it's not Karen, it is John Doe. They haven't identified a specific suspect. Um, but just the idea that it's some unknown culprit, I think the judge in this case will be inclined to say you can't raise this as a defense because you have zero evidence that anybody but Karen Reed killed John O'Keefe. Mm -hmm. Great point, Wendy. Uh, yeah, you know, look, we're all ears here. You know, be specific. You know, the idea that, oh, he, he was just killed at this party. Well, there were 12 people or something in that house. Who did what? You're saying that all of these people and then everybody after the fact, the paramedics, the lawyers, everybody after the fact engaged in this grand conspiracy. Um, when, as you said, Wendy, there's a mountain of evidence against her that we're going to be seeing real soon here. Uh, Dante Mills, uh, the third party uh, defense, if they are able to raise this. Um, how successful do you think this is going to be uh, if, if they're not specific? As I was saying, if they, if they don't uh, very clearly lay out how uh, their alternative theory uh, should win here. I, I can tell you this. They've already raised it. Yes, they are in front of the judge. Uh, and the prosecutor is asking them not to be able to bring it up in court. But there's nobody that's going to be in that courtroom that has not heard of this alternative person theory. Now, you do want to be able to, you can't just have smoke and mirrors, you have to have some kind of proof. I think they have enough there. I, there's, there's things that they can point to like um, the, the, the injuries um, that he suffered that were not consistent with a car. Something as simple as that should allow them to say, Karen Reed could not have done this, it had to be somebody else. They don't have to go and name the person who did it. They just have to point to things that should suggest that she didn't. And it's a it's really a fine line because if the judge precludes all of that evidence, if a defendant can't come in and say, I believe somebody else did this, if they have any type of evidence to point to, I think that's limiting their defense. And that opens up this whole entire prosecution to appeal. And if the prosecutor believes they have enough on Karen Reed, 
I don't know if they want to open themselves up to that appeals process unnecessarily. So really, why are they arguing that heavy against this if they believe it's all smoke and mirrors anyway, and if they believe that strongly in their case, they may want to protect themselves against appeal. Dante, thank you for that. Uh, let's take a look at some of the text messages uh, between John O'Keefe and Karen Reed showing the timeline uh, surrounding, oh, I'm sorry, this is between, here's what we're gonna look at. Let's look at this first. Let's look at the text between Jennifer McCabe and John O'Keefe. Um, so we know that they're all at this bar in Boston and then the idea is let's go back um, to the house of the Alberts. And these are all John O'Keefe's good friends. That's one thing that's really important to understand. All of these people, the people, the ladies that Karen Reed called upon in the wee hours of the morning when she was drunk and hysterical, uh, all of that, these are her boyfriend's friends, not her friends. And um, so they're asking for directions to the house and we know that they arrive there. The question is, as you look at this, does he go in the house? The state is saying, Wendy Murphy, that there is zero evidence that he entered that home. If they can establish that at trial, do they win this case? Well, I'm not sure. There's zero evidence that he went in the house. There's overwhelming evidence that he was killed by Karen Reed's car in front of the house. Um, this notion that he went into the house as somehow proof that someone else killed him, um, because it's such a bold claim and there is zero support for it. I mean, for example, everyone in the house agrees that he never went in. There is no physical evidence that he went in. Um, there is overwhelming evidence that he never left the area where his body uh, was found. Um, if the, if the only thing the defense has is some cockamamie technology uh, data that uh, is, is not remotely specific to where his body was, there, there's a real chance that they could irritate the jury by assuming they're stupid. I mean, when you put on a dumb defense and then you try to get the jury to believe it and they're like, what? You know, this makes absolutely no sense. Once you insult the jury by making a claim that's wild and ridiculous, they can turn against your client with a vengeance and find her guilty, even if they might have been inclined to have some compassion for her, because they don't like to be insulted. And that's why this idea that there's any proof he went into the house, much less that someone else killed him, is such a dangerous defense. Yeah, you can whip the crowd into a frenzy out front of the courthouse and try to get the public, you know, protesting. But there's a very different strategy now. You got to win in front of a jury. And they have no hope if this is their defense. In fact, I think they're more likely to lose if they promote this idea. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a really good point, um, Wendy, because of all the evidence found in the lawn outside the house, pieces of the cocktail glass he was holding in her taillight, microscopic pieces of her taillight in his clothing, no dog DNA whatsoever found on his body. There was the big dog theory prior to this. Uh, I hear your point, it's an excellent one. Uh, Dante, I wanna pick your brain about something else. Um, the Reed defense team has really gone hard on all of these police officers who were friends of John O'Keefe, they were all very close friends with him. And uh, they're going so far as to try to get their cell phone records. And something that happened at the last hearing was kind of surprising. You know, the way the Reed defense team sort of, um, you know, couched it for, for everybody in the public was that, oh, nobody wants to turn over their records. Let's listen to what Brian Albert's attorney told the judge. Brian Albert does not object to turning over the materials that are being requested. I understand that the Commonwealth may be having objections as to the Commonwealth's case, but Brian Albert does not have anything to hide. He does not have anything that he needs to, uh, to prevent the court from seeing this material. And if the court does deem, after reviewing the material and having access to the federal records, that these are somehow relevant, or that these are somehow admissible, and the court deems that Rule 17 has been satisfied, Brian Albert will comply with the court order. That was the theme of that hearing, Dante. It was just, yeah, take it. I mean, we think it's an intrusion on our privacy, but if the court's so inclined, take it. I can't wait to see all of these officers on the stand. Uh, Dante, do you think it's possible that the Reed defense team here is underestimating these police witnesses? 
No. And, and I want to talk about this because we are, your guest talked about um, the importance of putting forward a theory and how it can turn a jury against you. But Julie, you mentioned in your opening statement about the O.J. Simpson case, right? That case that had all the evidence in the world against O.J. Simpson, his attorneys put forward a theory that the entire investigation should be thrown out the window because one officer was racist and the jury did. So when you're a defense attorney, you don't have to prove anything. All you have to do is put forward enough to make the jury question the validity of anything that has to be proven by the prosecution. And if they can do that by saying somehow is sending, showing a text that may be questionable from one of the uh, police officers to, to somebody else, if they can do that by saying their cell phone uh, coverage that puts him inside that house, what does that mean? Why are they lying about him being in there? It works for them. Otherwise, what is their defense? What are they going to do? So they have the right to put forward a defense. They have the obligation to put forward a defense. They don't have to prove anything. All they have to do is create enough doubt. And these little things, they may not mean anything individually, but if they can convince one person on that jury that one of those little things means the case is not proven beyond a reasonable doubt, they win. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, fair point. Fair point, Dante. Uh, absolutely. I agree with you. Um, one thing I will say that's interesting for those who've really paid close attention to this one, the defense has changed. When just David Yannetti was representing Karen Reed at one of the earliest hearings, it might have even been her first court appearance, and he was speaking to the issue of bond. He said something to the effect of, Judge, this wasn't an intentional act here. This doesn't rise to the level of manslaughter. She didn't act with any intent. She loved him. Essentially, you know, people could draw the inference that, oh, this was an accident, an accident that she hit him with her car, if she did. And then Alan Jackson came in, and now the defense has changed to she didn't hit him. It was somebody else who did this and made it all look like she did. Um, I can't wait till this hearing starts. It's going to start at 9 a.m. this morning. We'll go in there live. And I'm so glad we have Dante Mills and Wendy Murphy sticking with us as we head to what's trending in true crime. Here's what we have next. I want to hear that story about how you convinced Christopher Darden to have O.J. Simpson try on the gloves. I've got a size 9 hand, perfectly average. It looks a little tight, so I tried it on. I said, this club wouldn't fit, OJ. In our spotlight this morning, we're looking back at my interview with legendary Simpson attorney F. Lee Bailey and what he said that won the trial for the defense. Plus, when we come back after this break, we're going to show you this video of horrific abuse at the hands of a school bus aide. We're talking about the school's level of responsibility and why this nonverbal child's parents want you to watch the video. We are underway in the trial of doomsday prophet Chad Daybell. Prosecutors say they will seek the death penalty against him. Investigators have recovered human remains at Chad Daybell's residence. There's no way long and I should never come up with this. His wife, Lori Valla Daybell, has already been convicted. Now, will her husband end up with the same fate? It's just so hard to know where the truth ends. It's the doomsday prophet, Chad Daybell, on trial. Do. Now for what's trending in true crime, the family of a missing Maryland woman now bringing their plea for justice to your TV screen. Family members of Rachel Morin have released a 30-second commercial campaign which feature, features Morin's mother as those closest to Rachel, who's a mother of five, look for a resolution to her tragic death. Rachel Morin was my daughter. She was a mother to five children. She's a sister. Somebody just grabbed her and took her. If he's willing to kill a perfect stranger, he's willing to kill anybody. If you know this person, turn him in. Let's do this. Let's catch this guy and bring peace to Rachel Moore's family. For more information, visit the website below. We know that Rachel Morin went for a walk back in August and sadly never made it home as her body was found the next day. Right now there is a $35,000 reward for information that leads to an arrest and conviction. So will this new commercial about Rachel Morin 
help investigators catch the killer. Let's bring in our power panel now. Still with me, former prosecutor, civil rights attorney, and author and professor Wendy Murphy. Want to welcome in law enforcement expert Sonny Slaughter. And still with me, uh, family law, or I'm sorry, also welcome in family law attorney Michelle Thomas. Uh, wonderful to see you all. Wow, what a, what a power panel this is. My goodness. Um, Michelle, I'd love to start with you on this one, please. What do you think the odds are that this commercial is going to help catch the person who murdered Rachel? Yeah, good morning, Julie, and to everyone on the panel. Um, I, I think it helps because the more publicity you can bring to a situation like this, the greater the odds as someone may see something, know something, and report it. So the problem right now is that it may not be widespread enough in the community, um, particularly in, the, in Baltimore and Maryland area, where people are on guard and looking. Also, that commercial, it, it's very, um, it appeals to pathos effectively, and it also drives a point home that this could also happen to you. If, if people don't if the community doesn't come together to try to find this person and report him, then it, they could be the next victim. So I do think that's a powerful statement. And the more publicity, the better the odds. Yes, certainly. Michelle, thank you for that. Sonny Slaughter, you're our investigator on the panel. Tell us your thoughts on this, if you would, please. Good morning, everyone. This is absolutely a power panel. I agree with my co-guests that this is very important. The film will help law enforcement get the leads, get the call-ins, identify those who might have good leads against those who have bad leads, uh, put a spotlight on the particular area so that individuals in that area traveling around the area will uh, see if they know something, they will uh, report it. And it is a very good way to keep the story alive in the public. I think this is an excellent, excellent idea. And um, I just love how it was put together really quick and people will remember this. You're right. It's powerful. They certainly will. Sunny, thank you kindly. Wendy Murphy, last but not least, your thoughts on this, please. I love when victims and their families do things like this. I do this a good amount. Um, in my cases, I represent victims all the time. You throw One thing you got to do is throw money out there, and there's a big reward out there. You, you know, people will come forward if there's cash to be had. So that's a piece of what's been done. And then this PR campaign, literally doing a commercial, um, is essential. I don't just think it's a good idea. I think it's an essential idea. I've done things like this in the form of billboards. You remember that movie, Three Billboards Outside? I forget where, outside somewhere, where a mother who was very upset about what had happened to her daughter um, put billboards up to call attention to some injustices, and it worked. When you put up a billboard or use a commercial like this, what you're basically saying is, we're not just relying on law enforcement to use typical techniques to find out who this guy is. We're engaging the public. We think all of you are super sleuths, and we know this country is filled with super sleuths who do help solve crimes. One way to get to them is to use the media. This mm -hmm. is a brilliant campaign. I love it. Yes, uh, Wendy, we're all with you. Absolutely. Let's hope and pray it works. Let's turn to some other big trending news now. A Colorado family is traumatized after footage is released of a bus aide physically assaulting a child with autism. Kiana Jones, seen here sitting next to 10-year-old Dax, repeatedly elbowed the boy in the stomach. The boy's family also claims that Jones slapped him in the face. This incident was recorded back on March 18th. Jones has since been arrested, charged with third degree assault of an at-risk juvenile. This is at least the third student with autism who claims abuse by the hands of a paraprofessional with the Littleton Public School District. And because this child is nonverbal, it was really important to his parents that the world see his face and see his response to what happened to him on that bus. We're wondering this morning, how responsible is the school for this incident? Let's bring back in our brilliant power panel of ladies. And Wendy Murphy, I want to begin with you this time, please. You are a former child abuse prosecutor. Talk to us here, please. Boy, is this heart-wrenching to see, but I applaud this child's family for wanting us to see this because as we all know, a lot of um, 
evidence in child abuse cases is considered confidential if it's gathered by CPS, for example. Uh, we never see it. You might see it at trial. I might see it because I'm the prosecutor, but the public doesn't typically get to see it. So I applaud them for wanting us to see it. It's really important that the public comprehend that there are adults out there who have the capacity to do these sorts of gruesome things to children. And I also just want to emphasize that Parents need to be able to sue schools. Sometimes the, the liability standards are a little too rough, if you ask me. And if we're trying to hold schools accountable for bad things that happen to children, you got to open the door a little bit more. It isn't easy to sue schools. This case is easy because they knew abuse was happening on that bus before this child was beaten, and they did nothing. I sue those kinds of schools all the time. It's important to sue them. Money speaks. Well said, Wendy. Thank you for that. Sunny Slaughter, to you next, please. Uh, thoughts on the school's liability and also the parents' decision to want America to see that little boy's face. I think it was critical that the parents wanted everyone to see this so that other parents could talk to their children, try to identify if there are any problems with their child that their child might be having that they haven't articulated. Also on the liability side, I'm a former school board member uh, for the city of Trenton, New Jersey. And one of the things that I think is really important is that just as Wendy Murphy said, that schools are at risk and that they when they know that they're at risk parents need to have the option to sue schools this is part of what they have should have been doing in their background checks and in other checks throughout the years not just those one time of year they need to be investigating individuals teachers educators paraprofessionals throughout the year because we have a lot of persons who are victimizing children within our school systems and um, not to say that we need to target everyone but we do need to keep our eyes open isn't that the truth? Uh, boy, Sunny, that school was so lucky to have you. Every school district should be so lucky to have a Sunny Slaughter on their school board. Thank you for those comments. Michelle Thomas, last but not least, would you take us home on this drawing on your experience as a family law attorney? Uh, your thoughts on the legal liability here and the child. Yeah, you know, as a family lawyer, I've had clients who have nonverbal autistic children and, and, per, and children with special needs. And it is so important, important to raise consciousness, as this family has done by publicizing the video, to make sure that the parents are paying attention, observing their, their children, the condition they're in when they go to school, when they come home from school. The problem in this situation is that these parents reported it to the Joshua School. And I understand the Joshua School then reported it to the Littleton Public School District to say, hey, there's a problem here and we have a strong suspicion that there's abuse occurring on the bus. And the Littleton Public School District only reviewed, I believe, one video and dismissed the allegations and dismissed the case and did nothing about it. So that's where there's going to be a significant amount of liability because they were on notice and yet did nothing. And these children are, are suffering as a result of it. Mm -hmm. So well said, Michelle. Thank you for that. Boy, big thanks to you, Attorney Michelle Thomas and Attorney Wendy Murphy for your time and expertise. I know we have to let you both go. Have a wonderful week and we'll look forward to having you back soon. Sunny Slaughter's coming along with us and we want you to as well. Here's what's up next here on Opening Statements. It is my interview with the late, great F. Lee Bailey. What he revealed about the famous cross-examination he did of racist cop Mark Furman during O.J. Simpson's trial. And still to come, the mitigating factors that could tip the scales of justice for Rust movie armor Hannah Gutierrez at her sentencing. O.J. Simpson in a knit cap from two blocks away is still O.J. Simpson. It's no disguise. It's no disguise. It makes no sense. It doesn't fit. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. This morning, we're spotlighting the O.J. Simpson murder trial as news of Simpson's death was met with mixed responses. Caitlyn Jenner, who was once married to Chris Jenner, tweeted, quote, two words, good riddance. But some of the attorneys involved in the case took a more somber approach. Marsha Clark, who was the lead prosecutor, of course, released a short statement saying, I send my condolences to Mr. Simpson's family.
Then there was another member of the Dream Team, attorney Alan Dershowitz, who advised uh, the team largely on appellate issues. He said that he was saddened to learn of his client's passing. And a few years back, you may remember I had the privilege of interviewing perhaps the most famous member of the Dream Team, the late great attorney F. Lee Bailey. We talked about his legendary cross-examination of Mark Furman. We talked about the timeline of events that the prosecution put forward and, of course, the famous glove. Why do you say that about the timeline? I know that's something your team really focused on. Why do you say that it's impossible because of the time? There were several defenses to this case, which is, for any defense lawyer, a form of enrichment. When you've got the backstops, so you say, and if you don't believe that, how about this? We had no motive in the case. That's very unusual in an side. Husband kills wife. And usually there's a lot of anger involved and a mess. Well, there was a mess at the scene, but never a speck on OJ that anyone could attribute to it. We had that defense. We had a demeanor defense where his whole attitude that night, when he got into the limousine, onto the airplane, into the limousine in Chicago, into the hotel, was calm, jovial. OJ is a very jovial, garrulous person until he got a phone call saying his wife had been killed. And then his whole demeanor changed as you would expect a person who didn't know it till he got the phone call. But the third was a timeline. The best defense in the world is an alibi. There are only two really good alibis. One is being in jail. That will usually stand up. And the other is visiting the Pope in the Vatican. That's a pretty good alibi. After that, they are too often people in the family, people who are friends. I mean, everybody is with somebody that likes them when murders happen. So we did not have an alibi as such. We had a series of alibis which, when linked together, made OJ's presence at the murder scene impossible. And that is the basis on which the jury, 10 of them, decided the case in 53 minutes and brought the others around with a little bit of reading for the transcript. Eight minutes later, they sent for the jury forms. Four minutes later, they returned them in a sealed envelope, and I knew what was in the envelope. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Orenthal James Simpson, not guilty of the crime of murder in violation of Penal Code Section 187. Mr. Bailey, let's talk about some of the really pivotal moments of the O.J. Simpson trial. Your cross-examination of Mark Furman is legendary and perhaps was the most pivotal point in that trial. Tell us how you prepared for that, please. You know, it's interesting how retrospect can shape people's memories. It was not a great cross, it was going to be. It was never finished. Judge Ito cut me off just as I was getting into the good part. All I wanted to do, all I set out to do with Furman at the outset, because bear in mind, although people suspected the contrary, I didn't know anything about the tapes when I cross-examined Furman. I had some witnesses that were pretty powerful, but the tapes were still out in Never Never Land until McKenna found them. I wanted to show the jury that this man would lie about something important. Did make a difference what it was. Anyone who comes to this court and quotes you as using that word in dealing with African Americans would be a liar, would they not, Detective? Yes, Trump? they would. All of them, correct? All of them. In that very powerful line of questioning where you crossed him on his use of the N-word, mm -hmm. you said the word out loud in open court. Mm -hmm. How tough was that for you to do, knowing that that word causes so much pain? You know, it was very unpleasant. I was brought up in New England. Uh, there were very few black people there. I remember my grandfather, who had a peanut butter, butter manufacturing company, made news in Natick, Massachusetts, when he hired a black man because Jim Crow was not too far to the south. Uh, and then I grew up with lots of black people, including pilots on whose uh, life 
mind dependent and vice versa, and always thought that they had gotten the short end of the stick. I hated to use that word. Johnny Cochran said, I'm not sure I could have mouthed it. But on the other hand, to undercut it, to soften it instead of hurling it directly in Furman's face, I think would have been a mistake. In other words, if a guy is threatening you with a deal, a duel, and you want a duel, you take your glove and swat him in the face. And the first time I dumped that word on him, he knew it was coming. It had already been read in open court by Marsha Clark in one of the dumbest moves I've ever seen a lawyer make. But nonetheless, every time the courtroom was electrified, every time the word was used, I got a lot of criticism for it in the press because in their trial wisdom, they thought I should have softened it up a bit. Well, that ain't the way the game is played. This is reality, and I saw no other course, and if I had to do it again, you bet. And you want to call me a racist? I, I really don't care. I mean, what am I going to do about it anyway? Do I go around the countryside trying to convince somebody or not? What would I do? What would I do? I was, I was heard on a screenplay uttering the N-word 40 times. I want to hear that story about how you convinced Christopher Darden to have O.J. Simpson try on the gloves. The trial of the glove on O.J.'s right hand, which became a fulcrum of the case, the only time I heard the press say he might get acquitted. Frankly, at the end of the day, it didn't uh, mean that much to the jury because they'd already seized on the timeline, but I saw the glove lying on the evidence table. My fault. We had never examined the glove. We were told whose blood was on it. We accepted that. We never checked the inside. And had we done so, we might have found some DNA from somebody else. And that would have ended the case right there. But I looked at the glove and I said, you know, I've got a size nine hand, perfectly average. It looks a little tight, so I tried it on. I said, this club wouldn't fit, OJ. So I decided to set Mr. Darden up. He used to come to me each time he did something in court and ask for a grade. Did I do a great job? And he always suggested an A, and the highest I ever gave him was C. But I wandered over to him, and I will use an alternate word. Um, but I said, you know, um, Christopher, you're okay, but you've got the cojones of a stud field mouse. Oh my goodness, I mean, I insulted his manhood and everything else all in one phrase. He said, why, why would you say a thing like that to me? I said, because that glove won't fit, OJ, and if you don't ask him to try it on, I will. Now, it wasn't even my witness. He took the bait. Oh boy, I could listen to him all day. I, I have to tell you, every defendant should be so lucky to have an F. Lee Bailey. And what I mean by that is not a high-priced, incredibly famous criminal defense attorney. I just mean one who believes in their cause. I will tell you this, I sat there and I asked him every which way how it wasn't possible that his client committed the crimes and he had an answer for everything and truly believed, I mean, looked me square in the eye and said, O.J. Simpson is innocent. And he believed that until the day he died. We're gonna hit a, a quick break when we come back. Here's what's next on Opening Statements. What's your place of employment? Here. Here, what's, your, what's the name of that? Oh, uh, Rust. What's your job there with them? Was. We're going to talk about the mitigating factors that could tip the scales of justice in favor of Hannah Gutierrez at her sentencing. This is an innocent woman. She didn't do it. It's a controversial case that's divided a community. Karen Reed is accused of murdering her police officer boyfriend. Prosecutors say she ran him over on purpose and left him to die in the cold. But Reed claims that she's being framed. It smells suspicious. After years of legal fireworks, will the truth finally be revealed? The end game is to figure out who killed John O'Keefe and hold these people responsible. The killer or cover-up murder trial. Live coverage begins next week, only on Court TV.
Now for what's tipping the scales, Hannah Gutierrez will be back in court Monday morning to learn her sentence for the shooting on the Rust movie set. Now it's been just over a month since Gutierrez heard these words. We find the defendant, Hannah Gutierrez, guilty of involuntary manslaughter as charged in count one. We find the defendant, Hannah Gutierrez, not guilty of tampering with evidence as charged in count two. Movie cinematographer Helena Hutchins was killed after a live round was loaded into the gun that Alec Baldwin was using for a scene. Now, Gutierrez is asking for probation, but facing up to 18 months in prison as a max. So what mitigating factors might tip the scales of justice in her favor when the judge gives her her sentence? Let me bring back in trial attorney and law professor Dante Mills. Okay, Dante, if Hannah Gutierrez is your client, tell us what you think is mitigating for her, please. Well, I, there's a couple of different factors. One, uh, her age, you, you always use that. Um, she's, she's younger. Um, you, you, you try to show that she did not have full control. They tried to do that throughout the trial itself, uh, and it wasn't successful uh, in convincing the jury that she wasn't responsible at all. But as far as sentencing goes, I would go in there and say uh, she was younger. Uh, she was inexperienced um, to a certain degree, and there were people on that set that took control. Um, so all of this should not fall on her. And I think that should mitigate her sentence a bit. I, I do believe that she will do some jail time, but I don't think she's gonna do a lot. I think the judge has to kind of make a statement here, at least to, to say um, that she has to turn herself in and do a short amount of jail time. But I don't think it's gonna be a lot of jail time. She obviously uh, does not have any priors. And this is not a situation where uh, there was any intent behind it. Um, so really, what is the gain if you're putting her in jail for a long time? And those are all factors that the judge is going to consider. There's no criminal history. There was no intent to hurt anyone here. But someone did get uh, killed, and, and that's uh, very tragic. And there has to be some responsibility. But there are a lot of factors that says uh, Hannah sitting in jail won't be beneficial for anybody, uh, society, for her, or for anyone else. Right, Dante. I've got a clip from her interview with police. Let's take a look. Who handed it directly to him? Or did you hand it to Dave? Mm, I handed it to Dave after lunch. Or then Dave gave it to us. Yeah. Do you know what was in there? Dante, you just said it, other people taking control here. The assistant director, David Hulse, who got a plea, got a plea deal uh, for probation on this one. Um, I expect to hear his name as well as some others. We heard a lot about the guy named Seth Kenny, who was the ammunition supplier in his company, PDQ. Uh, it seems that there are a lot of other people who perhaps are going to be brought into this. Dante, tell me, when you see some time behind bars, curious, you got me thinking, if, if 18 months is the statutory max, do you think we could see the judge give her a county jail sentence versus a state prison sentence? Absolutely. I, as always, Julie, you're, you're hitting the nail on the head. So just so everyone understands, a county jail sentence is anything uh, a year minus a day. Um, you're allowed to stay in the county and not go upstate is what they call it. When you're sentenced to anything a year or beyond, you're transferred to a, a, a more secure facility and, and a more um, direct facility where they can control you for a longer period. Uh, there's some benefits to, to, to remaining in the county. You know, you're not around those kind of hardened criminals that are being sentenced to longer sentences because they did more uh, hardened crimes. So uh, the preference would be to stay in the county. I think the judge will do that. We'll sentence her to a county sentence that's lower than a year and a day. Um, that proves the point where you know somebody has to be held responsible, but at the same time, uh, it doesn't send her away for a long time beyond what's required as punishment here. Mm -hmm. Exactly, Dante. I, I wonder if Jason Bowles will explicitly ask for that if the court is so inclined to not give her probation. We've got to leave it there for now. That's going to happen next week. Uh, Dante Mills, we love having you on this show. Thank you so much for your time and expertise here on Opening Statements. Have a great weekend.
And my friends, you can watch or share this episode if you like. We've got them every day. We put them up on our website. Go to CourtTV.com, click on the Shows tab, and you can rewatch or share the episodes of your favorite shows here on Court TV. We are just minutes away from heading to Boston. We've got the final pretrial hearing for homicide defendant Karen Reed. That's next.